Terrors episode, with stories sent in by you, our Microterror listeners. Send in your own story at microterrors.com. Welcome to Micro Terrors. Scary stories for kids. Where it's always the spooky season. Full of chills. Thrills. And spine tingling spooks. Micro Terrors are family friendly frights for those ages 8 and up. And while our stories are for younger ears, we are still talking about things that go bump in the night, and some children may not be able to handle what others can. Parental consent is recommended. Now, for tonight's Micro Terror. The Bitter Lake, written by Alara Ula, age 11. It was mid-autumn and could not possibly ever have been colder, rainier, or more bitter than it was now in Bitter Hollow. April Carter trudged through the autumn leaves, her backpack digging into her shoulders walking back from school. The winding path that lay ahead was long and muddy. The rain thundered down. Dead, bare trees towered over the path. Next to her, her best friend, Layla Gardner, walked beside her also wearing a backpack and a weary expression. The day couldn't be more miserable. The trees in the deep, dark forest beside them were in an intense fight. The wind was strong and vicious. Just visible behind the tree was the lake, the Bitter Lake. A strange name, April had once thought to herself, but that quickly was answered by the strangeness of Bitter Hollow. The lake appeared to thrash wildly, also seemingly battling with itself aggressively. As she walked, April hoped the storm would ease up a little, but it only got worse. Layla stopped suddenly, peering through the trees at the lake. That lake is so weird. What? I mean, yeah, I guess. It's just that I was wondering. We've never been up to it before. April frowned. I know. And? We could go now. In this? <laughs> Are you crazy? The storm is one of the worst ever. That lake is so weird, she repeated, looking a little dazed. She shook her head. Come on. People have seen things, remember? Ellie Simmons said she saw money. Layla rolled her eyes. Simmons, yeah. She sees money everywhere. And Tom Miller said he said a bunch of random things that were obviously a lie. A TV and gaming console? That's ridiculous. Those aren't things you see in a lake but things people hallucinate when they really, really want them. Well, Katie Evans uh, saw an animal, a hurt one. She wanted to help it. She tried asking for some others to come first, but everybody was busy. Oh, there's one thing they all have in common. All these people who have seen things. April cried desperately. She paused to catch her breath and then whispered, they've all gone missing. Layla hesitated, then nodded, but then caught sight of something in the lake. That lake is so weird, she said once more. What is it? What do you see? April asked, finally understanding. What? Nothing. It's just... What do you see? April demanded. A necklace? Can you see it? Gleaming in the sun? And that ruby in the middle? So huge, she whispered excitedly. Sun? Layla, there's no sun. It's just clouds. Be quiet, April she interrupted bitterly. I'm going. She set off, running towards the bitter lake. She threw off her backpack and coat and kept going. April looked around, looking for anybody who could stop her, but saw no one. She put her backpack down and followed her, calling out every so often. There was a blood-curdling scream. It chilled every bone in April's body. She stopped. There was no sign of Layla, and possibly even worse, April was lost only the lake was visible, as it was large and different to its surroundings, unlike the narrow, winding path she was previously following. As she neared the lake, April could only now appreciate how appropriate the name was. 
bitter indeed, with its gray water crashing against itself, the pier looked isolated, extending out into the dangerous water as if it were reaching out. But most strange of all, even in the rain, the storm, the wind, April could see lights, lights under the lake. They were dull and gray, but bright and strangely clearly visible. April stepped closer to the massive lake and peered at the lights. They were definitely there. Suddenly remembering what she had come for, she examined her surroundings more carefully, not just the lake. Layla wasn't here. But that scream sounded so much like her. There was an odd sound, and it took April a moment to realize what it was. Whispering. Help us. You'll help us, won't you? It was coming from the bitter lake. A hand shot up from the ghostly waters. It was pale and belonged to a child. April was sure of it. The whispers were louder, more desperate now. April approached the lake, stepping onto the pier. She had to help the person in the lake. It was a child, drowning in the lake, that was all. So why did she feel so uneasy looking at the hand? It didn't look quite right. It was too late. April reached for the hand. It reached back and grabbed her hand. Yes, come join us. High-pitched laughter followed. The hand was cold and smooth. It pulled her in. Its grip too strong for her. She was sucked in by a torrent of freezing cold water. It was all around her as she plunged into an icy darkness. Moments later, she realized her eyes were closed, and she opened them. April realized she was unsure of which way was up, all sense of direction was lost, and there were two sources of light. She swam towards one, but quickly realized it wasn't the right one. The light had just gone out, and she felt thousands of things grabbing her. These weren't weeds, but hands. Then she saw it. By the flickering light, hundreds of dolls and even more doll hands reaching out to grasp and scratch any part of her. The light went out, and April felt something impossibly painful. Then it felt like her stomach was completely empty as she lost all feeling. She tried to scream, but it was no use. The Stone Hill by Harrison Van Middelum, age 10. This story, like many, starts with once upon a time. So let's start with 1528 in a kingdom called Monteplicus, with a small village known as Fort Trenton. Now, this place was known for its vast majority of delectable foods and large feasts of steak, turkey, or sometimes even mutton. However, the place was also known for the spirits roaming the streets on cold, foggy nights, unbound by time and mortality. The most famous of the housing areas for the apparitions was the Stone Hill, built way back in the 1100s as a tribute to an ancient god of war and destruction, only to be used as a shooting range for archers. The ruining of such a divine building with several holy figures, forever frozen as statues built on top of the hill, led to the god's wrath upon the small mountain of basalt to eternally be inhabited by ghosts and phantoms of all kinds. Now we begin with a tiny and rather plump man fashioning an old tunic that squeezed him due to his large belly. However, it still comforted him through cold, glum nights such as this one. He was riding on horseback, accompanied by only the ride, named Daydreamer, for its ability to fall asleep during the day and stay wide awake at night and the man's name was first of his family, Philip Douglas. In spite of the depressed midnight sky, he was filled with much joy as he had just left his parchment requesting a job at the church. Tomorrow, the chance would be over as they would stop collecting the applications. On his way home, Philip decided to stop at the Stone Hill, forgetting about the mystical stories of specters roaming on cold, foggy nights that so often spooked him. Reaching into his pocket to draw a cross, he saw light. Strange light it was, for it wasn't even moonlight, it was red. He thought nothing of it because he most likely passed it on as a sign from the god to whom he was praying, which just happened to be the god of merciful spirits, 
who was a foe of the god who owned this hill. After praying, he got back on his steed to ride home. However, just as he took the reins, he heard a thunderous boom that sounded as if a hundred stones of obsidian suddenly collided with the speed of lightning, and again the monstrous sound repeated in the same manner. Philip looked behind himself to see a giant, humanoid figure that dwarfed even the largest of the already large stone houses. Then the absurd giant locked eyes with the man, now shivering with the sudden cold of the spirit's presence and fear. The behemoth let out an ear-piercing screech, breaking the ground and almost shattering Philip's eardrums. Then it started a chase upon Philip, who in return kicked his horse once in the side, which sent it dashing through the cold night of mist, leaving tracks of mud behind it. Philip took a better look at the specter and realized that it was transparent and had a strange symbol on its torso. It was the symbol of the war god. He looked up at the beast's head and saw two glowing white eyes that seemed to speak to him in threats that he'd not yet heard. Then he started to slow down. He looked at Daydreamer, who seemed like he was being forced to stop instead of slowing as the result of becoming tired or hurting themselves. Then the ginormous shadow reached down and picked up the terribly afraid Philip, who was hoping it was just a dream. Unfortunately for him, it wasn't. The creature stared at it with its eyes tearing into his soul, seemingly ripping it straight out of his body. The giant's eyes turned as red as the blood that ran through Philip's body at that very moment. The next day, Philip was given the job. However, when it was time to show up, he didn't, and the priests assumed he was sick. The third time Philip didn't show up for the job he so desperately wanted, the priest grew worried and decided to check on Philip. However, he could not find him anywhere. That was until he found Daydreamer, feeding on some grass near the cursed hill of stone where the kingdom's bishop had said they had last seen the man. The priest then searched the hill and found something. A rounded body of stone, wearing a stone tunic to match. Further inspection of the hill found the head of none other than Philip Douglas, frozen in stone. Now it is said that the god of war had taken his life for trespassing on his sacred mountain of rock. Others say it's because he didn't give an offering before entering. However, one idea everyone shared was to never go near the ancient hill of stone. The consensus was that you could upset a god that you definitely wouldn't want to upset. This has been a special Listener Terrors episode with stories sent in by you, our Micro-Terror listeners. Thank you for listening to Micro-Terrors. Join us each Saturday for another scary story. For more fun, visit our website at microterrors.com where we will also have spooky games you can print out and play, like wicked word searches mysterious mazes, and more. Microterrors.com is also where you can find us on your favorite social media and even send in your own scary story for us to tell. Plus, you'll learn more about our author, Scott Donnelly, who has other horrors for both young and old. I hope you'll join me again soon for Micro Terrors, Scary Stories for Kids. Hey weirdos, be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at weirddarkness.com listen.